Hey, what's up everybody? This is the KMN 1971 back with another fat stack of comics. Man, I have been failing miserably as far as one of my New Year's resolutions go as far as trying to cut back on the volume of comics that I've been buying. And um, I guess it's a good problem to have. <laughs> Uh, I've been buying a lot more current books as of lately, even though I cut back on my uh, pull list at the end of last year, uh, due large in part to a couple of new titles springing up, uh, discovering a new store and getting some books that I missed out on the first time, and catching up on some Immortal Hulk. But next week, uh, well, next month, rather, well, probably the end of this month, <laughs> um, I'll probably be back to normal where I'll only have around like 20 current issues and more back issues. But... Without further ado, let's get it on, because I have probably about around like 64 books to show off. So, kicking it off, Shazam number 3. Beautiful Cho cover, probably one of my, my all-time favorite Shazam covers. But it's not saying much, because <laughs> there aren't many Shazam covers out there that I really like that weren't done by Alex Ross, rather. But, um, good series. I'm a big Jeff Johns fan, but I'll give this probably, I don't know, 6 to 12 issues to really wow me. It's a fun book so far, though. Fun read. Something different. The Green Lantern, number four. Um, I, I think this is probably Liam Sharp's best artwork to date. Uh, beautifully colored and just dripping with Grant Morrison. Cool weirdness going on. <laughs> I have no idea where he's going with this still, but enjoying it. Uh, the most I've enjoyed a Green Lantern title since Jeff Johns uh, left the book. Back in, uh, what, when? Uh, early New 52. Superman, number eight. Once again, I have to say it every time, I am um, really surprised how much I've been enjoying Brian Michael Bendis' run on Superman. Just a well-written, beautiful, beautifully illustrated by e Ivan Rice, and uh, aside from this weird life ill cover, just a, a good grab um, month after month. Book that's not usually on my pull list, but considering it was crossing over with Batman for this month, had to pick it up, and I am a fan of a good old-fashioned Batman and Flash team-up. So here we have Batman, I mean, excuse me, The Flash number 64. And number 65, which I'm happy that they finally got around to letting us know, more or less, what's been going on with Gotham Girl, who kind of like has been a, a plot line that has, or rather a plot thread that has fell through the cracks. So um, we still don't get a real resolution of what, what's transpired but at least they're you know at least they went somewhere with it and i thought it was a pretty cool um team up and it kicks off like i guess another storyline for down the road so a couple more breadcrumbs another title that i uh, look forward to every month heroes in crisis number five which was excellent and number six which was good but it's kind of felt like a filler issue almost a little padding there, but a um, big fan of Tom King, and this is what comics are, are all about as far as I'm concerned. Great writing and great artwork. Justice League Annual number one. Usually annuals nowadays are just throwaway events or books just for completists, but um, actual stuff happens in this annual. Um, you get the cameo appearance of Perpetua, and you also get to see the, the sauce wall, uh, spoiler alert, uh, crumble and disintegrate. So ramifications for the DCU and a uh, pretty good read. Which shouldn't, which shouldn't surprise, me, surprise me considering Scott Snyder's involved. So um, Justice League number 17 and number 18, two very weak B variant covers, which um, has been happening a lot lately with DC. I don't know what's going on, but uh, at least the interiors are good. So uh, good story, good art, can't complain. Consistent title. A near contender for um, cover of the month, but Batman Who Laughs uh, was beat out, obviously. But the Batman Who Laughs, number three, really enjoying the story. The only thing is, though, for some reason, I don't know if it's just me, but sometimes I have a hard time um, reading the dialogue of the Batman Who Laughs. I don't have that problem with uh, Cosmic Ghost Rider, which is the same kind of uh, red lettering with the black backdrop in the you know, in the dialogue, but for some reason, I don't know. <laughs> I have a hard time reading the font with the Batman who laughs at times. Sad but true. And 
staying on the sad but true theme. Detective Comics number 997, 998, and 999, which um, concludes the, the initial um, storyline that was allegedly the countdown to Detective Comics 1000. Um, if there's any kind of um, plot threads that will bleed into Detective Comics 1000, I don't know, but I thought this was going to be leading up to the debut of the Arkham Knight. And, <laughs> spoiler alert, it did not. This was pretty much just like a filler arc and uh, did not like the ending. I was pretty disappointed, to be honest with you. Um, I like this John Byrne uh, variant B cover, but guy <laughs> my age... You're always going to have like kind of a pro positive, a, a pro positive bias towards um, John Byrne, but yeah, very disappointed in this arc. Great artwork, but um, didn't I was not a fan of the ending whatsoever. The biggest dud of the month. Batman number sixty four, cool Sean Murphy um, sideways B variant cover. I I think it's amusing that um. People will crap all over Frank Miller's artwork, but they love um, Sean Murphy's artwork. I happen to like both. Batman number 65, also part of the crossover with The Flash. Not really a fan of this cover either. But I am a fan of these next couple of covers. Wonder Woman number 64, beautiful, beautiful art germ cover, which will surprise no one. And of course, this Holly cover that came out, I don't know, probably earlier this month, um, or rather last month, Holly Quinn number 58, which is also a um, crossover with that. Well, not a crossover, but it has a, a Batman appearance, which is always good. And the last DC book I picked up was Naomi number one. Missed out on this last month. Kind of fell way under the radar. I didn't even know about it, to be honest with you. But uh, on one of the Google Plus pages, some some speculators were speculating about this book. Enough so that I got me curious and I ended up picking it up for a, at, for a cover price at one of my comic shops. Um, looked it up on eBay and there were a couple of sales out there already at like 35 bucks, if you can believe it or not. So um, Brian Michael Bendis, when it comes to first appearances, his first appearances, I missed out on uh, Jessica Jones when... Alias initially debuted back in, what, the early 2000s. So um, when it comes to a first appearance by Brian Michael Bendis, I pay a little bit more attention uh, than, than usual. So I have no problem speculating on a new character if I can get it at cover price or, or less. So it's part of the fun part of the hobby. And it was a good read. I'd recommend it. This is the, the B cover by Lupacino, I, I believe. All right, a couple of indie books. Seven to Eternity, number 13. Always a great read. Always in my top five when it initially comes out. And The Magic Order, number six. Love that cover. Love the creative team. Um, and I really ended up digging the story. The last two of Mark Millar series that I have read, this and Reborn, uh, I've really liked them. Look forward to book two on, on both of those. Getting into some of the Marvel stuff. Savage Sword of Conan, number one, which up until this week was going to be my cover of the haul, but it ended up getting beat out by Savage Sword of Conan, number two. I don't know. I just think that is a, a future iconic Conan cover by uh, the great Alex Ross. Can't go wrong there. God, crazy. Conan the Barbarian, number three. Love what Jason Aaron's doing there. And I picked up the B cover just because I've never seen Conan slashing at a scroll before. That's just cool. Venom, number 11. Had to go with a Dave, Gibbon, Dave Gibbons uh, Watchmen homage cover. And, uh, or homage cover, however you would like to pronounce it. But, um, love this. And, uh, just really dig this title, too. Donny Cates and Stegman. Great creative team. Um, and I was never a Venom fan. Like, I liked... I've never read a Venom ongoing series. I always liked Venom if he would star in a Spider-Man book or whatever. But this is just a great series. Highly recommend it. And uh, I guess Midtown was running a special where you could get this issue and um, Guardians of the Galaxy autographed by Donny Cates. So I picked up uh, one copy of this 
and another copy of Guardians of the Galaxy, the wraparound cover signed by uh, Donnie Cates. So you'll be seeing those in um, uh, the next haul. Speaking of Donnie Cates, Guardians of the Galaxy number two. Uh, all I can say about this, this is the most I've enjoyed uh, Guardians of the Galaxy uh, title since uh, Abnet and Lanning in volume two. So that's about it the highest praise that I can give <laughs> a Guardians of the Galaxy creative team. So really good stuff. Looking forward to issue three. I just, uh, spoiler alert, I just hope that it's not Star Fox that has uh, Thanos' consciousness downloaded into him already. So I just hope that's not the case. All right. It has been far too long since I have thoroughly enjoyed an issue of Uncanny X-Men. But that's exactly what happened with issue number 11. All I'm asking for is a good story, good art, and characters that I actually want to read about. And that's what I got in this issue. So much so that I ended up coming back for the next issue. So, uh, so good to have Uncanny X-Men on my pull list again. And uh, hopefully it can remain there for, for a while. On the other hand, the return of Wolverine. Yeah, like I've said before in... Pro uh, previous hauls, Marvel has really screwed the pooch with the return of Wolverine. I don't even really give a shit anymore. So here's number five. And uh, Wolverine Infinity Watch number one. That was in my pull list somehow, but uh, I will not be continuing on with the rest of this miniseries. So I'll, I'll just read a summary of it online. It's not worth it. Moving on. Star Wars number 61. Always a staple. And some Immortal Hulk ketchup. So I ended up getting a third printing of number two. And then the rest of these are all first printings. Number four. And all at cover price. Number five. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. I already had number 12, so I picked up number 13. So I just need issues six and seven now, and I can finally read them all. I've only read issue number one so far. So, All right, now finally, on to the back issues. Conan the Slayer, number one. Bought this mainly for a cover grab. Um, this is just a killer, killer Lee Bimejo uh, Conan cover. And a decent read, too. Wasn't bad. Hellboy the Storm, number one. And number two, I don't know about you guys, but Hellboy is just drying up in my area, man. I'm just grabbing whatever I can. I have to pick up a copy of issue number three, obviously. Batman Adventures, number one. I'm a sucker for these Batman animated um, premiere issues. Iron Man number 227, which was, um, I guess it was on CBSI, Topher posted that this was the first appearance of Hulk Hogan in comics. And now, while I don't watch um, WWE product as of now, but I was a big wrestling fan for years and years, I think I finally tapped out around the end of the Daniel Bryan, uh, CM Punk era before Daniel Bryan was injured. So, um, I do watch an occasional match here and there. I, I watched the, the triple threat uh, women's match uh, for the TLC match with uh, Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch and, oh, I forget, Sokka? I, I forget her name. I don't watch all the time. And I also watched the Brock Lesnar-Daniel Bryan match. But other than that, those are like the only two wrestling matches I've watched all year. Um, but as I said, big wrestling fan. This was allegedly the first appearance of Hulk Hogan. But I have to say I disagree because this is all that they're basing this on. Okay, so, oops, right there, this guy at the bottom that says, body slam, use a body slam, that allegedly, to C uh, according to CBSI and Topher, is the first appearance of Hulk Hogan in comics. Are you kidding me? So, I would have to agree to disagree with that kind of speculation. I have no idea how anyone could make that kind of leap just because of when this comic was published, and to say and put it out there that that is the first appearance of Hulk Hogan, I call bullshit. Moving on. Green Lantern Corps, number 201. 
This is the first appearance of Kilowog and a couple of other Green Lanterns, but I already have a copy. But this is a newsstand copy in a little bit better condition than the copy that I have. Pretty cool. It was only two bucks. Dazzler. Number one. Sucker for those old premiere issues. What can I say? The Legion of Superheroes, number 298. The first appearance of uh, Amethyst. Once again, I own a copy somewhere buried in one of my long boxes, and I own the entire Paul Levitz and Keith Giffen run on the Legion of Superheroes. But uh, this is also a newsstand copy, and I believe the copy that I have was a direct edition. Once again, going all along with the same theme, um, Fury of Firestorm, number 24. This is my second copy. I have a direct edition copy, but this is the newsstand copy, and it's the first appearance of the Blue Devil. Peter Parker, Spectacular Spider-Man, number 101, and I just love this for the uh, Killer John Byrne cover. One of my favorite uh, black suit Spider-Man covers from this era. And cheap. Um, Amazing Spider-Man, number 185. Peter Parker graduates from college. Little DC implosion goodness from the 1970s. Man Bat, number one. I bought this mainly for, you know, I thought it would be kind of cool for my Batman collection. Something from the Bronze Age, cheap. I think that was like $5. But uh, once I opened it up, I realized, as you can see, it guest stars Batman, but it was illustrated by Steve Ditko. So I think there's something really cool for, to the fact that Batman being illustrated by the co-creator of Spider-Man. Cobra, number one. More DC implosion goodness. Uh, if you can't make it, to Hydra or AIM or even the Hive, <laughs> try applying it to Cobra with a K. First appearance of the Cobra organization. Super Friends number 25. This is the first appearance of Fire, but I believe that she goes by the name of the Green Flame in, um, in this comic. I own the Newsstand edition, but I believe this is the Direct Market edition, and it's also a Whitman. And I don't have many Whitmans in my collection. Also, in better condition than the copy that I have. Always happy to uh, chop off a couple of Tomb of Draculas off of my Tomb of Dracula run. Tomb of Dracula number 63 and number 65. And also, considering that Conan is back, has given me a little bit of a bug to uh, go after some of those Conan back issues that I want. So I, I have a quest to get all of the annuals, giant size... I would like a run from now from uh, 100 to 115, which is the initial Roy Thomas run on the title. And a couple of graphic novels and um, variants. And a couple of odds and ends here and there. Anywho, here's uh, King Size Annual number three. Guest starring, well, also starring King Cull. I haven't actually read this yet. Conan the Barbarian number 59, which uh, features the origin of Bailey. And now I guess we'll get into some of the key comics. All of those books were between, I don't know, like three and five bucks. So here we have the Savage Sword of Conan, number two. And this was on my list because this is, um, well, it's the second issue of Savage Sword of Conan. It features a Neil Adams cover, and it also contains the first published artwork by Mike Zeck in Marvel Comics, which I'm a big Mike Zeck fan. I think he is totally underrated. I mean... I don't know why he wasn't put in the same kind of category as, like, say, Frank Miller and Byrne and Perez in the 1980s, because um, as far as how you, the criteria for rating a great artist back then, did he have, you know, good runs on titles? He had a, yeah, Master of Kung Fu and uh, Captain America were pretty damn good runs, in my opinion. Um, did he, do, was he involved in any classic storylines? Well, yeah, he was. Secret Wars, um... The Punisher miniseries that catapulted the Punisher to superstar, I mean, Wolverine, Spider-Man superstar status. And of course, my favorite Mike Zek story, um, Craven's Last Hunt. So, as a Mike Zek fan, as a Marvel fan, as a comic book fan, and as a Conan fan, I'm happy to pick up this book. Iron Fist number 10. And number 11, which finishes off my uh, Iron Fist run of his of, so, of his solo series. I still need an upgrade, I believe, for issue, well, for the last issue, I believe issue number 15. Um, other than that, it's complete. I can read them all now, but I still need a, probably four more issues for the Marvel premiere run. So after I get those, I'll probably just binge read it.
Aquaman number 38. The only Silver Age book in this uh in this haul. Love this Nick Cardi cover. I've become a, a big Nick Cardi fan over the past uh, year or so, mainly thanks to YouTube. Adventure Comics number 452. And this is a book that has gained a little value in the past month or so. So if you can find this one out on the cheap, like I did, I think I paid like $5 for this. Uh, this features um, the death of Aquaman's son. And um, it was all, I believe it's been referenced by Alex Ross as one of those Age of Innocence comics. Uh, well, rather an Age of Innocence coming to an, an end kind of comics. So, um, yeah. I picked this up for like five bucks. There are, have been a couple of uh, sales between like tw 20 and 30 bucks online. So as Aquaman gains in popularity, well, you know, mainstream popularity, who knows? So if you can find it out on the cheap, I would pick it up. Jungle Action number eight featuring um, the origin of Black Panther. I, this is the first time that uh, Black Panther's origin has been featured, but usually they always elaborate and add a little bit more. So I think this is maybe like the third time that uh, Black Panther's origin was done. I would like to go back and pick up uh, this Black Panther run in jungle action. It's really good. And finally, my pick of the haul. Miss Marvel. Phase four. <laughs> Uh, Miss Marvel number one. So, um, this is one of those books. I'm a big sucker for those, uh, Bronze Age premiere issues. This was one of those books that I was missing out on, and it's definitely the most expensive book that I picked up this month. Um, happy to pick it up. I'm looking forward to going to see the movie next week, even though it's not one of those movies that I'm really, truly psyched for, to be honest. I'm mainly going to see the next installment of this ongoing storyline that's been going on since, you know, the first Iron Man movie back in 2008. So, uh, but, I, I mean, the controversy surrounding this movie just because she said that she didn't want the press corps to be dominated by white males doesn't mean that she hates white people, people. Chill out. <laughs> the main thing that I'm worried about in this movie is that they tried to push Miss Marvel as... You know, the the, star, the rumors that I've been hearing is that she's going to be the most powerful person in the Marvel Universe, the most powerful hero in the Marvel Universe. And I don't know, you, you shouldn't push her to the front of the line like that. Um, but with that said, it's going to be awesome to see Captain Marvel on the big screen. And I love all those Marvel cosmic characters, even if uh, we're going to get elements of the Kree, Skrull War. So I'm psyched. So yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> That's all I got on that. Uh, nothing too controversial, controversial, I don't think. So, um, yeah, I'll be back at the end of this month with a haul for all the books that I picked up in March. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you all then. Thank you all for watching, liking, and subscribing. Take care. See ya.